Welcome to Magic Club. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Mr. Jordan Gold. How are you, sir? I'm awesome. I'm so excited. You know why? Because it's our first ever episode of Magic Club. Ever, ever. We've only been talking about it for a while now, actually. Yeah, and you know, the sad part is, is right now, there are only two members of Magic Club. <laughs> Just you and me, buddy. Here we are. Uh, so just for our self-esteem, if you're watching this and uh, you're not turned off right away, just click subscribe. Click subscribe or wherever the button is. Uh, we need, we'd like to have another member or two of Magic Club. That would be great. One would be good or two more. Would, what? Would, it would be like kind of if the internet decided to just, just prank us and be like, no, nobody ever become, nobody ever subscribe. So it's just these two losers in the two man Magic Club. We could, it would be the most exclusive magic club on the planet. It's just Andrew Mayne and Jordan Gold. Oh, yeah. That's it. No other members. It sounds kind of awesome if you're asking me, though. I think that's a pretty rad club. I think so. Maybe we should just uh, never launch this show and just keep you and I talking like <laughs> we'll that. We'll just watch it. We'll just send the video back and forth to each other. <laughs> um, I recommend we show people this. We share this, and we bring everybody else into our clubhouse because I think the Internet needs its own magic club. Yeah, I guess we could do that. Yeah. Uh, we'll try it and we'll see. See how it works. And if that doesn't yeah. work, start us. We'll give them a chance. So, what is Magic Club going to be? What is this going to be? What are we trying to do here, Jordan? Uh, we are trying to create a fun community and talk about magic because that's what we all love, right? We love magic, talking about magic, doing magic, performing magic, learning magic, reading about magic. Yeah. Did I miss anything? Magic cereal. All of that. So we want to do we're gonna do news. We're also get we've got some awesome people who've said yes, they're going to appear on Magic Club and let us talk to them about that. Uh we want to get in the history of that. And also what we do, there's a second part to Magic Club, which won't be a public channel. It's going to be a private thing. It'll be for our Patreon supporters. We're gonna do a Patreon campaign for this if you go to patreon.com slash magic club. That's going to be these secret sessions where today we're going to do a session after this. After this part of the show is over, we're going to start our other secret session, which will be we're going to do some cool work on some iPhone magic. Jo Jordan's going to show us the working on his uh, Siri finale. We've got some other little tips and things like that on how to use your iPhone for a cool trick. So we're going to have a secret session for that, which is available to people who support us on Patreon. But again, this is the fun magic section of it where we talk about what we love about it and share some of those things. So let's start off right now, Mr. Jordan Gold. What's new? What's new? What's the coolest, latest, or most interesting thing you have to say about magic? Uh, about magic, there's so much going on with magic it's completely transforming i think uh just the fact that magic is everywhere right now mm -hmm. there there's new movies coming out there's new shows coming out there's new venues that are opening up all over the world there's just uh every day it seems like magic is getting bigger and bigger and bigger can i mention the movie that you just worked on Maybe. So Jordan, so most people watch probably have no idea who we are. We're magicians, if you haven't guessed that. Uh, we love all kinds of magic, close-up stage, platform, whatever you can do. Uh, my background is a stage illusionist, and I also did a TV show called Don't Trust Andrew Maine on A&E. Jordan is uh, one of my favorite people to watch as a performer. Jordan's super creative. Jordan's been a magic consultant as well. Jordan's been all over the place with a lot of different things. Actually, you just got back from, we'll talk about where you got back from, but tell me, what is this, so this movie, did you or did you not consult on a movie? It is called Magic Camp. Uh, it's a Disney major motion picture coming out this summer. It should be... Uh, Pretty great from what I've seen. I've only seen a little bit of it so far. Uh, but yeah, the, the magic consultant, the head of magic was Justin Willman. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. his core team was Chris Chelko and Franco Piscali, who, if you don't know Franco, he's 19 and he is a force of magic. He is ridiculous and can do all the moves that you've ever read about and that most people can't do. He not only can do them, but is flawless so it's insane um and you know chris and and justin are amazing as well mm -hmm. uh, but uh i think everyone agrees franco's hands are just insane yeah he's... But, um, the uh i was brought in because uh they needed a 
a few magic doubles to do some of the fancy handwork uh, that match some of the characters. And lucky for me, I look like the lead character or one of the leads whose um, uh, main purpose is to sort of antagonize the others with how good he is at magic. <laughs> um, so I, I'm the hands behind the flashing, you know, not quite a bully or a villain, but right. sort of bordering on that. Uh, character. I hope I can say all that about the movie. I don't know. Right. Um, uh, but they didn't tell me what I can't say. So that sounds good to me. Uh, so that's cool. That I mean, it's kind of flattering that, like, you know, your hands are good enough. We'll put you in a movie. You know, uh, it was uh, pretty amazing. You know, it, I got the call and uh, I just I went for it. You know, I, I may said, or yeah. may not have talked to somebody who saw some of the behind the scenes stuff of some of the stuff you did, and it looked really awesome and very challenging. So that's Super cool. The, the amazing part about it is that they were talking about just doing some cutaway shots, you know, just your classic, uh, here's the hands and then cut away and then you've got the rest of the shot. And for this, they actually brought in a uh, visual effects specialist who put a green screen sock over my head. <laughs> and and so, it wasn't really uh, for green screen. They just were playing a gag on you. Yeah, they just didn't want to look at my face, basically. <laughs> While I was shooting, I, you know, it's just the hand. Here, just, need, just put this on. It's making awkward eye contact with all the actors, and then we can't have that. So just try to drive home with it on. They didn't say I could take it off. Exactly. So they put this thing on me, and I'm standing there, and I could see, sort of see through it just a little bit. But I mean, it's it's like you know, stretch a t-shirt over your face and then look through it. That's kind of like what it feels like. And I could just see the director, and he's kind of holding back laughter because here I am, surrounded by kids, and I'm towering above them, <laughs> keep squatting down to keep myself from looking too tall. And I'm also, you know, trying to move my head around and look where I have no idea where I'm right. supposed to be. Uh, with all these kids who are busting up laughing. But it was a very technical shot. Um, they were telling everyone not to move at all because if one kid moves, then all of a sudden it doesn't line up. It's $10,000 um, more in the effect. Exactly, at least. Um, and they had to shoot the, the scene twice. They had to shoot it with me and then take me out of it and then take in the, uh, the actor and put him there. And then uh, he's not doing anything because he's not doing the magic trick. And so he just has to sort of move his head where he thinks my hands are going to be. So his his head is disembodied in a second <laughs> shot, following my hands around uh, where, he, where he sort of uh, planned them to be when he was watching me. And then after the, uh, the fact, they're going to basically take his head and put it onto my body. And we're going to watch him do interviews, talk about how hard it was to learn those moves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope not. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have a great photo I don't I don't think I can share any of the photos yet but um, uh, I'm sure once the movie's out they will they will surface and we'll, we'll post those but uh, and we may have another shot. member of Magic Club by then too oh, well yeah we might have somebody to share it with by that time yeah. um, there's I have a great shot of me in the green screen hood but then I, I took a shot with Justin Wilman um, for posterity you know afterwards just for memories and the joke was kind of, oh, well, here's Justin and Jordan, but Jordan's got a green screen head, so you could kind of put in any other more <laughs> famous person than Jordan. Like, oh, I don't want a photo with Jordan. You could put in, like, Beyonce's head or whatever you <laughs> want. Here's Justin and Beyonce on Magic Camp, you know, dudes working on it. So that was um, that was one of the, the scenes that I shot. And that, that was, I did a fun Ace production from Dan and Dave. And uh, a couple other little flourishes, and then the uh, the second time, the second day, um, they brought me back a couple weeks later to throw a card into a watermelon, which was pretty fun and awesome. And uh, again, I got the the text, "Hey, can you throw a card in watermelon?" And I'm like, "Well, I know I'm really good at throwing cards, but uh, I don't know, so we'll find out." And uh, we practiced it, and I'm able to do it, so. That's now a thing. Watermelons I, beware. Old card in watermelon thrower. Mm -hmm. And the entire time, all I could think about is being a kid, being like 13, 14, 15 years old, standing on hills in my hometown, just throwing old decks of cards one by one, like off the hill to see how far they could go just for fun and thinking, oh, I might get in trouble that I'm sort of littering these cards all over the place, never thinking that it would end up with me one day. actually on camera for money. In a movie, uh, doing that. Movie. 
Yeah, which is kind of surreal. So uh, keep doing your weird stuff, kids, because who knows? Uh, someday you might be in a movie doing it. That's so probably, the, probably the worst yep. advice we've ever given out. Keep doing your weird things, kids, because you might be in a movie doing it. Yeah. Never know. It could be. <laughs> yeah, no, you probably could. Maybe not a Disney movie, but you could be in a movie. So. I went to see David Copperfield last week. Um, my buddy Marcus Eddy was in town. Marcus David. was performing at the Magic Castle. Uh, he did a fa- fantastic job there. Marcus is a magic inventor. Marcus spent a year working with David Blaine on David Blaine's last special. Marcus is is just really, really brilliant. But he had a few days before, and one of the things we did was we drove up to Las Vegas to go see David because we're both fans of Copperfield. And I thought I was a fan, but we were, I was playing some clip where I mentioned something, and, and Marcus started, like, reciting David's lines, like the whole David Copperfield rap and all that. Marcus wow. had it down. I'm like, you're, like, as big a fan as I am. Like, let's go see him. So we hopped in the car. We drove to go see to go see Copperfield. And uh, our good buddy Chris Kenner is the producer of the show, and, you know, uh, we got to see Chris there. And it was, it was funny because I guess uh, David knew I was there, but David, you know, looks out into the audience and turns to Chris and says, hey, is that Marcus Eddy? And so <laughs> that, that made Marcus's week is, you know, when, when your hero, like David Copperfield says, hey, he's at the show. So we got to talk to David afterwards and all that. But the really cool part was, for me, is I love the fact that Copperfield is still inventing and creating new magic. Yeah, I love the fact that he does, has not stopped and he's still trying to perfect things. I think that that's, you know, that's the sign of a perfectionist is somebody who keeps working on it and trying to continuously make things better. And and he will he's had stuff in the show that he added a bunch of new stuff and he's had stuff there that he's been working on for a long time that he's constantly tweaking and trying to improve. And I think that's that's I had the the uh, pleasure of working on one of his specials years and years and years ago as a teenager and watching behind the scenes how perfectionistic he was about things, watching how how much time he would spend just trying to figure out the perfect way to close a door to a prop. And I swear, walk, working with uh, Joni Spina, who was, uh, bless her, she was, you know, was wonderful, watching the two of them together figure that out. And I could not tell you what the difference was. They knew there was a difference, and that's why David Copperfield's David Copperfield. Right. As he could tell. Well, and, you know, David, as everyone knows, is a huge fan of rubber band magic which is probably why he was so excited to see marcus because marcus does amazing things with rubber bands as well so yeah absolutely so So, uh, i should mention that every episode i'm gonna try and take whatever thing that you're talking about and just relate it to rubber band magic because i think that's really what everyone wants to hear about is rubber bands right so uh those of you don't know jordan is the uh what is the uh what is your title now what was your title I was I was the prince of rubber band magic, uh, and that was you know I, I I think I earned that title I think I earned it, nice. and then uh, about a couple months ago uh, I was hanging out with Chris Kenner at Disneyland, and he he did dub me the king of rubber band magic. So from you know from Chris's mouth, I think he's uh, he's sort of an authority on rubber band magic, and uh, you know. It, it wasn't me that said it. It wasn't me. But well, no, it is you saying that. I have no corroborative evidence that that actually happened. Like, oh, you know, and, and David Copperfield took me aside and said, "Andrew, said you, you, you're the future of magic." Yeah, that I did believe. not happen. But as far as you know, it could have happened. It sounds like it did, though. It sounds like it did. I hear this. You'll back me up. Actually, once uh, I sat next to uh, a girl who was from China at his show. And and she turned to me and she because they 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 brought me the you know, the assistants brought me out the program or whatever and the girl turns to me and says are you his brother I'm like no no and anyhow Chris Kenner overheard this and so she was doing the meet and greet and so I'm backstage and she's backstage and David walks out and points to me and goes to, so says to the girl and says yeah you know that's my brother she's like oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I would Wait, be the, uh, the Danny DeVito what's that I do you know you're not his brother. I would be the Danny DeVito and the twins to Arnold Schwarzenegger sort of relationship there. <laughs> you know, that's my loser brother. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> so that was kind of funny. So one of the things we want to do in, in Magic Club is we want to get into a little bit of history here. And we thought that maybe every episode what we could do is talk about a famous historical magician. And I was looking for – I had one lined up. I had the one I was going to do. I found an amazing bit of uh, – 
cool kind of history and a little story about this other person. I'm doing him next episode because I looked up another guy and found out he died today. Not today, today, but died on this date. We're recording this February 13th, 1936. This magician who's extremely famous as far as a historical magician. You've seen his posters. Charles Joseph Carter, born in June 14th, 1874, passed away February 13th, 1936. The day we're recording this. So I thought I'd read a little bit from his Wikipedia here so we can get a little history on Mr. Charles Joseph Carter. Again, Carter the Great, as he was known, his posters were fantastic and very imaginative. And so I'm going to probably throw some of those up as I talk about this. Born, as I said, June 14th, 1874 in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, Carter began his career as a journalist and a lawyer. As time passed, he grew an interest in magic. Due to stiff competition for the number of magic acts on the American stages at the time, Carter opted to pursue his career abroad, where he achieved his greatest fame. Among the highlights of Carter's stage performances during his career were the classic Sawing a Woman in Half Illusion, an elaborate surgical-themed version with nurses in attendance, making a live elephant disappear, and a cheating the gallows effect where a shrouded Carter would vanish just as he dropped at the end of a hangman's noose. Carter's first theatrical experience occurred at the Herzog's Museum in Pat Harris's Masonic Temple in Baltimore at the age of 10, where he appeared as the Master Charles Carter, the original boy magician. Carter purchased the famous Martinka Magic Palace in 1917, a time when he was unable to continue his world touring magic show. According to here, the story goes on that he kept his lying Monty in the back room of the shop, it was a magic shop, and it would roar, it would startle the customers who would run for the door. And there's some little more interesting things, but one of the things that was from uh, the Jim Steinmeier book, the fantastic book, The Glorious Deception, The Double Life of William Robinson, who was Chung Ling Su, is he mentions in the book about the famous Keller levitation and how so many other magicians were trying to copy Keller's levitation, and Charles Carter was not above that. He hired two of Keller's assistants, and they brought the, the secret of the illusion to him, and Carter put that into a show, and he took that onto a world tour, and in Great Britain, where he performed at Manchester. Um, and they and he, he put his own enhancements to it. One reviewer who had seen Masculine's original levitation praised Carter's insisting it's magnificent, it is perfect. So... Uh, there is a whole history of like who still stole what from what and how it kept moving forward there. But an interesting person in magic history who was contemporaneous to, you know, to Houdini and to Howard Thurston and others and actually died the same year Howard Thurston died, 1936. So you had something you were telling me earlier about Carter. Yeah. Did you hear about his secret warehouse that he had up in, uh, speaking of David Copperfield and secret warehouses, uh, up in San Francisco? No, you know, this story. This was so I could have some of the facts wrong on this, and if anyone has more information uh, of all of our so far two members, uh, please please uh, let us know um, if if you know you've heard something different. But this was information I heard through a couple magicians up in San Francisco, growing up there uh, in the magic scene, where he had a warehouse where he kept all of his props and illusions and everything. And when he was on tour, uh, he actually created a false wall in the back of this warehouse to store all the props. And uh, he rented out the rest of the space um, while he was away and just to make money. And uh, he apparently died on tour. Died in India. And nobody, well, there you go. And nobody knew. No, sorry. Uh, wait, he died. Yeah, he died in India. Died in, uh, okay. was in India, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is a. Uh, we need more members so we can get all our facts right because everyone <laughs> knows that the internet loves to get all the facts straight and to correct everything that we do. So uh, right now we're just correcting each other till we we get more uh, more members out there. Um, but nobody knew about this warehouse or this secret like area, and years went by. Apparently, no one decided. No one had the uh, thought to measure the outside and the inside to decide. As one it. normally does when they move into a new dwelling. They should. You should. Uh, everyone should measure their outside and interior walls to make sure that everything lines up. Otherwise, you don't you want to find out you have Gary Busey hiding in the house. <laughs> you, ne- you never know. You could. It's happened before. Be here now. Uh, so it wasn't until years later when they were uh, almost ready to knock the building down that somebody put a pickaxe. 
Uh, it could have been a sledgehammer, but I heard it was a pickaxe mm-hmm. through one of the walls and found out that there was all this, what they thought was junk and we're going to throw it away until somebody realized what it was, put the pieces together. And then there was this sort of bidding war of everyone trying to, uh, this previously thought of garbage. Now everyone wanted to get it cause it was valuable. Um, and, uh, it went to a couple different people. I don't know exactly who I can probably find out. And sure, it all ended up in David Cumberfield's warehouse. Um, but a friend of mine, Jay, uh, Jay Alexander, who's a really great, uh, corporate magician who's out of San Francisco ended up with a beautiful, huge Carter poster that's up in his, uh, in his house now. And I've seen it with my own eyes and that's the story of where it came from. Uh, so we'll try and look into that and, and provide some more information there, later. There are, there are some interesting kind of magic artifacts that we don't know what happened to it. Like one, one thing is Houdini's airplane. So when Houdini, Houdini had an interest in flying, Houdini went to Australia and is accredited by many as being the first person to fly in Australia, although some Australians take exception to that. But I think as far as like the, you know, the bodies that recognize that Houdini was supposed to be the first person who flew there, his airplane that he bought, we don't know what happened to it. We don't know what happened to that airplane and it had Houdini written on the side or whatever. And so it's kind of a little interesting, like, where did that go? You know, what happened to some of these things? And oh, it's a mystery. It vanished. So Jordan, like now's the point. That, What's that? I like that you mentioned that uh, Carter vanished live elephants. It wasn't until uh, halfway through his show they realized that people didn't like seeing the vanishing of dead elephants that much. Yeah, it was cheaper. You know, easier to feed a dead elephant. Uh, <laughs> just you just animate them with, with strings, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you have not seen the the Penn and Teller or the vanishing of the spotted elephant, uh, I think that's the effect. That have you seen that? I have seen that. It's, it's pretty great. Brilliant. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. Um, so a lot a live spotted elephant. The yeah, live spotted elephant. Live spotted yeah. elephant. Jordan, this is the point of the show where if we had a guest, I would or you would interview them. But you're here and I'm here, and I figured I'm gonna test out my interviewing with you before we bring on guests and I screw everything up and ruin everything and Magic Club comes to a crashing halt and gets rejected by the internet. So you ready? You ready for the interview? I'm ready. I, I think I'm ready. You think you're ready. All right. Jordan. It's Jordan Gold. Jordan Gold, is it? All right, sir. Question number one. Have you ever used magic to pick up a girl? Oh, um, wh- okay. So define like pick a up. girl. Um, we don't have to be specific. Or, What's that? Uh, yeah, oh. <laughs> define girl. I uh, define pick up. I mean, what, what, uh, where are you going with that? Is it, does it count just, <laughs> Uh, getting a cute girl to talk to me or like how Well, far when you showed me a rubber band magic trick, were you trying to pick me up? I mean... <laughs> it's getting very personal now. I mean. Awkward. <laughs> you did, your, your, Meredith, his girlfriend, did say she was going to go into her room and lock the door. So, you know, while we recorded yeah. this, so... I, I put a towel under the door so she can't right. hear it. So, <laughs> but I would say like with the intent of dating a girl, like getting a phone number or whatever. Have you ever done that? Oh, I've definitely gotten a phone number. Yes. Um, so when I was in college, that was like the you know the time I was doing a lot of magic and also trying to pick up a lot of girls. And um, I distinctly remember it was I can't remember if it was on my birthday or not, but it was um, this like Irish pub upstairs in Indiana, um, Bloomington, Indiana. And there was a really cute waitress that uh, I, I wanted to get to know better, and so I did. Go on. I did some card magic for her, and she was uh, super nice. And at the end, I asked for her number, and she actually wrote it on the card. Um, I didn't like ask her to write it on the card, which is kind of a cheesy joke. Don't do that. That's that's lame. But. You know, she did have the Sharpie in the card and she wrote it up. I actually came across that card recently. It was in one of my old Moleskin notebooks. I was going through some... You should call her. I finally picked up the nerve to call. <laughs> well, she actually lives in Los Angeles now. So we're, we're still friends because... Um, oh, wow. I, I did actually call her. Um, oh, we back then. On... Okay. Yeah. Back then, yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, we went on a couple dates and then uh, I'm there was 
the end of senior year. So I moved out to. She realized LA. you were serious about magic, and then she's like, "Oh, yeah. I thought you wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor, and well, this was just a hobby." We, we, you know, got into, you know, uh, hung out with some friends and went to a bar. And got back to a room together, and then I, you know, showed her some more card tricks, obviously because yeah. she was super into them. And so, you know, I did like forty minute set, and after that, she's like, um, "You know, it's not really." Not really why we're here. I'm like, oh, I, I thought. Do coin you like, magic? I got coins. Yeah, rubber bands. I mean, I got all sorts of stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, so it nothing really, you know, happened too I, much. But. I I dated for a while a girl I met like the first time I ever performed at the Magic Castle, and and there was this very beautiful girl who was in the front row. She was there with a date, but more of a Magic Castle date, not a guy she was dating, just a guy that you know, got the castle, and. uh I asked her to help me out with something, and she seemed like I thought she was drunk, but it turned out she was just very, very nervous. And uh, it's basically uh, the same thing. Yeah, and anyhow, we 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 connected and ended up seeing her for a long time. But the thing was, is like she loved she loved like my magic, and like every time I'd see her, I'd have to go put on like a magic show, <laughs> and I had to like just and I was getting exhausted coming up with new stuff. You know, I'd be going to the magic shop like, what's new? I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. All right, practice my car, knock on the door. Hey, how you doing? You know, and then and then it's like one day I'm like, I I don't got it. I'm I'm done. I don't have any more. She's like, oh, so I guess this is the day the magic died. Uh, We still saw each other for like another year, but it was just kind of this sort of, oh God, what have I got myself into? Like, I normally never used to use magic to like, I never, like, I went through a phase when you're younger, like you use magic, you talk to girls, but then you're like, all right, I don't want it to be the magic guy. And also you don't want that situation happening where you have to use the magic to do that. But it is, but also it really can feel like kind of cheating because it's just like, if you're in a party or whatever like that, you're like. Well, I know if I do magic, I'm gonna—I'll be the most interesting person here because I know a stupid trick, you know, and and it works like that. But then it's like, all right, but then what? But then what? But so the answer to that is yes. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, for me, in in high school and the, the early college, like the first year and a half, I really was using magic to to talk to people, and then you know, I sort of figured out how to talk without needing to do magic and yeah. my attention went from down at my hands to sort of uh, up at the eye level and oh hey there's actually a human in front of me and mm-hmm. i can put the cards away and actually have a conversation for more than five minutes about something that's not related to magic he says as we talk for an hour about magic as you sit in front <laughs> of a wall filled with magic <laughs> Uh, next question. You have a very interesting answer to this, and and I, I don't know if I'll always ask this question because I think t- sometimes the answer is going to be the same, but your answer is different. What made you decide to become a magician? I grew up around magic a little bit because my older brother uh, was was into magic the same way that all kids are. So he's eight years older than me, and he was thirteen, had magic, and did magic at my birthday party and, and things like that. Um, but he recorded on VHS a magic special that aired in 1990 on Fox called The World's Greatest Magicians Live at the Magic Castle. And we just had this VHS tape that just said magic on it. And I still have it somewhere. Uh, it's, it's just like very precious at this point. But this special uh, aired like once. I feel like it, it was just on TV for 45 minutes ever in the history of TV, and it never re-aired. It I don't never remember at all, and I paid attention to everything. It never surfaced on YouTube. It never came out on DVD, or it just wasn't. It wasn't around. It was like this thing that that only I knew about because I couldn't find anyone else that really knew this special that well, especially up in San Francisco. Um, and I had this this tape, and I watched it. You know, almost every day, like mm-hmm. I religiously, I watched this thing over and over because as a kid, I had no idea how this stuff worked. And I thought I did. And I was really wrong about pretty much all of it. Um, an example of that is one of the magicians is um, the, the magicians that were on it was it was uh, Kevin James, Paul Kozak, uh, Brian Gillis, uh, Johnny Ace Palmer, Goldfinger and Dove, Steve Spill. Uh, it, it ended with Lance Burton doing uh, his full dove act, and then he levitated a, a, a parakeet inside of a silver ball. It was very dramatic. And uh, I think if I'm missing anybody, apologies. But um, it was an amazing special. And 
uh, years later, I saw Steve Spill wrote, I think it was in Genie or Magic or somewhere, he wrote about um, the experience of filming that and how they had to do it at like 4 a.m. at the castle because the castle is open seven days a week. So they, they had to film it super late at night and just his experience with it. And I remember reading that going like, oh, my God, it did, like, it did exist outside of my VHS tape. The people actually were in it. Um, but yeah, as a kid, I thought, you know, Brian Gillis is doing winged silver and he's using sleight of hand. And I thought he was, I literally thought he was just moving the coin so fast. You couldn't see it. And I, I would follow like on the screen, I'm like, see, there, that's the moment that he threw the coin. <laughs> there, I know that's when he did it. He must've done it there. Um, and so as a kid, you kind of don't think about what's real and what's not. You just take everything in. And I don't think I ever went through that that moment of realization that maybe the magic castle was a TV show and didn't really exist and was a made up. thing. I just always went, Oh wow. This, this is a place where there's magic happening. And it was, it was pretty cool. They took all the chairs out of the, the showrooms and people were standing, they were wearing like masquerade gowns and masks. And uh, it was all very dramatic. There was like, balloons everywhere and they, put smoke machines all over and they, they shot, you know, if you walk through the castle, you kind of get an idea of where things are. It, it's a little bit uh, labyrinth like on your first time, but then you can kind of get a good internal map of where everything is. It's, you know, it's a house, but they would like shoot down this hallway with fog and it was dark. And then right as you got to what would have been the staircase, they like cut away to another hallway or is it, I think it's the same it hallway. Like it's Hogwarts. Going, it made it seem like it, there was yeah. a million uh, places going on inside, and it was just uh, – it, it's a really cool special. I think and that's actually- people's perception when they first go there because it is – you see the castle, and it is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And I tell people this, like, oh, no, I'm like, no, no, really, and it's because they built in underground into a parking garage and everything like that. But it is – it's kind of one of the cool things about it. it is bigger on the inside than it is appears on the outside. And you go through there and you go upstairs, you go downstairs, you go further downstairs. It is this very labyrinthian environment. And it's much bigger on TV than it is in real life. That's for sure. Yeah. There's, there's a great episode of, um, it was the show Monk, um, season seven, I think. I'm not sure which episode. Um, but it was uh, starring Steve Valentine. Andrew Golden Hirsch was in it. Uh, there's this great scene where uh, there's a suspicious janitor sort of walking away and Monk says, oh, uh, Mr. Janitor, sir, where is the restroom or not the restroom? The um, where is the, the dressing room? And the janitor points you know, off to the side and Monk looks to what if you know the Magic Castle, you know, is a wall. There's nothing. There's like a wall with just a little ledge, just enough area for you to like hide your body. And he turns and he walks into this wall and then they cut away to him walking into a dressing room that's not even in the Magic Castle because right. the Magic Castle dressing rooms are kind of small, especially for a film crew. So he's just in the magical, right. beautiful dressing room. And you're going, if, if you know the castle, you watch that scene, you go, OK, I, that's ridiculous. I once uh, we went to let I had some friends that were making a movie. We let, once let them use when I was younger, let my use my parents house to go shoot something there. And they made their movie, kind of low-budget sort of movie, but they got distribution. But part of the distribution deals, they said that we need to have more nudity. So there's a scene where you see this cop searching this house, opening up doors, and he opens up a door. And there's literally just a topless girl sitting on a couch reading a magazine. He just turns and looks at him. He's like, oh, okay. And shuts the door and walks. And it's my bedroom. But it's like not. They shot that in some completely different locations. He watches this guy open up the door to my to my room, and there's like this girl. Oh, hello. <laughs> And closes up the magazine. It's just most random nudity you could imagine. They just cut into there, which um, maybe that the castle could have used that too. All right, next uh, question, sir. Yes. Um, give me two or three influences on you and magic. Who are people that inspired you? Who excited you? Uh, so starting with somebody that everyone has heard of, um, I would go with. Uh, that's a weird way to set it up, but um, the. When I was a kid, um, I grew up around the San Francisco um, magic scene, and we had Misdirections Magic Shop, Mm -hmm. and Joe, who is a proprietor and still runs the shop, had lectures. He has put together a really amazing lecture series, and I remember he got 
uh, Shudogawa and Apollo Robbins to come and do their, their two man lecture. And Shud had just moved here. I don't think he'd even moved here yet. He was, he had just come to America and was like bringing all these amazing techniques and, and doing, you know, tons of stuff with the muscle pass and hiding coins all over the place. Um, and I remember going to that lecture and just being blown away by the, the, the idea that you can make a coin fall up using sleight of hand, like, and all these other techniques. And I, I would say that those, those two guys shoot and Apollo starting with that lecture were a class. huge influence on, on the sleight of hand that I started getting into and all the really hard finger flicking stuff. Uh, so much so that, uh, I, I practiced it over the years so much. It becomes so ingrained that when I saw Apollo years later at a magic convention in Vegas, I'm watching him do his stuff. I'm like, wow, yeah, this is, this is the, the stuff that I love. Like I'm so into, this is the exact style that I, that, that I like. And then I realized like, Oh yeah, that's because it, <laughs> I, I was directly inspired from him. Like he's the guy that did it. It's just, I was so removed from, from hanging around Apollo because it, uh, I didn't really get a chance to see him much after that lecture for years, um, as opposed to Shoot, who I got to see his lecture a couple more times, and he lives mm -hmm. in L.A., and I've gotten to spend more time around Shoot. So those guys and their work um, super inspire me. Okay. And then um, also Frank Olivier, who mm, is an amazing wonderful. juggler. You, yeah, you know Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a world-class world juggler from uh, uh, San Francisco, and he... I met him when I was 13 and he um, lived in a old firehouse and would invite all of his sort of vaudevillian circus friends over for these parties and myself included. And he would, it would it'd be a regular party, he'd be hanging out and then he would have everyone sit down and then shows would happen and everyone would, would, uh, perform and you'd have like the uh, Dave Capro, the yo-yo king would come do these amazing yo-yo tricks where the yo-yo string wasn't even attached to his finger and so the yo-yo is flipping all over the place. He had trapeze uh, oh, wow. rigging set up from his ceiling so all these aerialists came in and did it was like basically a full search show uh, right in his living room and downstairs in his basement he had built sort of a close-up magic room um, and he always invited me to like, Hey, come perform. And I'm like, uh, surrounded by professional entertainers. And I'm this kid who's just getting into magic and he, he didn't care. He's like, it doesn't matter. Just bring, bring something new or something you're working on or whatever it is and come get in front of these people and really encourage me to perform. So, uh, that was the sort of starting point of just as a kid being surrounded by all these weird circus people, you know, who were not like scary, carny weird, but right. sort of inspiring and artsy weird, you, you know? know, it's interesting. I had somewhat, not quite that experience, but I had, I had a friend whose father came from that community in San Francisco. They moved to South Florida and his name was Cisco, Cisco, the kid. And I was my, my friend's dad. And so my friend rocket, uh, went to school with any, any rocket knew I was into magic. So I got to meet his father, Cisco and Cisco knew that I was into entertainment. And so Cisco introduced me to this sort of crowd of like some, you know, different sort of performers, comedians and ventriloquists and stuff. So as a teenager, I was hang, spending more time with them than I was with magicians. So I was paying, you know, hanging out with that more artsy sort of crazy kind of crowd. And I think that was kind of probably very helpful. That's why I started doing cruise ships as a teenager was because I was around these adults doing this sort of stuff and who had to make a living by it. And that can be very influential. Yeah. You have, you have, man, can you do the, the quick version of there's a, a Frank Olivier card trick in a car? Oh, uh, just the story of it? Yeah. Oh, so, um, Frank was performing at the uh, the Palm Springs Follies, uh, and growing up, my my family has a place down there because we used to just vacation down there. It's just easier mm -hmm. than traveling somewhere else every you know every year. Uh, we just ended up getting a place, and so I'm sitting here in LA, going like, oh well, I could drive down to Palm Springs and hang with Frank and spend some time because he was it was kind of. It was awesome because he's the he was the guest entertainer there for I think a month or something. So it was a long run, and uh, he would Facetime me to do card tricks from his dressing room because he's like 
he's in Palm Springs in the middle of the <laughs> desert with no friends. He's like, oh, I'm so alone here in my dressing room. I just want to practice magic, but I don't have anybody to. And like, Frank's one of the warmest, like, most fun people I know. And here he is kind of just like sad and alone in his dressing room. So I drove down um, uh, just to hang out with him. And at the end of the run, he had to drive all the way back to San Francisco. And he just didn't want to do that alone. So he offered if I wanted to go with him just to drive back and as a chance to visit my family. And then uh, I flew home afterwards. So it was kind of a fun trip. So on the way, we're doing card tricks and we're practicing. Uh, this is the this is card tricks, by the way. As right. Was right here. We were practicing card tricks and kind of just talking magic back and forth. And he he's he's... Uh, he has a deck of cards in his hand and he's driving like actually with his knees, just kind of keeping them. <laughs> going. And, and he says, Hey, take your phone out and, uh, and start recording me. And I'm like, oh, okay. I thought, you know, we were going to do a fun thing. I don't know what he wanted, but he's, Hey, just, just turn your phone on. And then he puts, uh, puts the window down and then he starts yelling out the window. Hey, Hey. And, this car is coming up next to us and they stop. Uh, they don't stop, but they they match our speed. And he goes, roll down your window. And the guy's like, okay. So he rolls down his window and he goes, yell out the name of any card. The guy goes, what? Yell out the name of any card. And the guy says, I don't know, two, two, two. And Frank says, two of what? And the guy goes, two, I have two of diamonds. So okay, okay, watch, 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 watch. And the guy's like driving down the, 580 going like 80 <laughs> miles an hour. Frank's like, look at me. And he throws the deck up into the air and then he snatches one of the cards with his mouth and he, you know, rips it out and he turns in his, he's got the two of diamonds in his mouth. And the guy sees it and you can see the guy like, does a thumb <laughs> up and he drives off. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is crazy. Cause he's still driving the car at this point. And I'm just filming like, this is, <laughs> It's it's you know if you think David Blaine street magic approaching strangers is weird, you know try doing it while driving eighty miles an hour on the freeway, <laughs> and then and then don't Frank try goes, this at home, kids. He goes, okay, now you do it, you do it. I'm like, I'm Frank. I'm not gonna yell out. I'm not gonna do magic at people. And he's like, okay, well then I'll do another one. And so he did like five more cars, and <laughs> I could not believe. Like only Frank has a personality where he could actually get somebody driving 80 miles an hour to notice him and then comply and name out cards. And the whole time he's legitimately finding these cards from the deck and doing magic for these people. And the people were completely blown away. And then they drove off. There's, and- there's something about that fearlessness. You know, David Williamson was at the Magic Castle last night, and David Williamson's amazing. He's a god. And 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 guys who are super experienced close up magicians will watch David in awe. And David's going up to strangers and do it, just blowing their minds, doing way comp- more complicated stuff than these people have any idea. You know, and you know, they ask him his name, he says it's Steve, whatever. And he's just this fearlessness of just going out there and do that. And Frank's got that, Williamson's got that, that just Go out there, do it. It doesn't matter because it's, you know, they both have incredible skills. And, you know, Frank's a juggler. But he's an amazing magician and his skills are just you know, off the hook. You know, that's, that's man, there's one thing to learn. So there's one other of my favorite Frank stories is that he has this amazing vanish, um, which I won't get into, but it's, mm-hmm. it's one of the cleanest coin vanishes you've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And the first time I ever saw it was at, uh, Rudy Kobe's, uh, like sort of comeback El Ray show, uh, which was uh, about five, five or six years ago here in LA. Um, and Frank does this vanish for me and it's just, the coin is here. And then the coin is just completely gone and it can come back too. It can come back and can go away. It, it's, it's all sleight of hand. It's completely amazing. And I'm sitting here just completely fried uh, by this experience. And then he tells me the story of, um, I don't know why this happened, but he was on a nude beach with Jeff McBride. <laughs> and said, uh, uh, all two members of Magic Club, you're welcome. You will never be able to get that out of your brain. But uh, he's on a new beach with Jeff McBride, and he walks up with this coin. It's a sil- uh, silver dollar-sized coin. He's like, oh, hey, Jeff, uh, check this out. And he vanishes the coin, shows that it's completely gone, turns around, completely naked. Frank's naked. Jeff's naked. The coin is gone. 
And then Frank just walks away. And Jeff is sitting there going, uh, uh, oh, okay, uh, all right. And uh, I think that's the that greatest point is. vanish in, in all of Magic history that, that yeah. up until now has has not been officially told that story. <laughs> and we thought our club was exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, sir. I'm going to skip right down now to one of the things we're going to do every week on Magic Club. We are going to declare the world champion Magic Champion. Woo. This is going to be a title that is going to be bestowed to... Whoever can answer this quiz correctly, okay? What card am I holding? Uh, is it a red card? No. It looks like a red card. On the back. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you mean the front? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say the seven of spades. Seven of spades. Two of clubs. Close enough, sir. You are the world champion magic champion. Yes. And those of you paying attention, it's always going to be the two of clubs. It'll always be the two of clubs. So uh, we'll see. Our next guest will be able to unseat you as the world champion magic champion, but that's going to be our official title I bestowed upon you, sir. So you currently have it until we bring somebody else on who guesses it or maybe doesn't guess it correctly. It really doesn't matter because it's all about the title, not about how you got it. Do well, let's do a let's do a pick. I'm gonna do a recommendation, something I picked up which I thought was, it's it's gimmicky, but I thought it was a really cool effect, and it's by one of my favorite magic inventors, and that is Luver Fiedler, who is just was an incredible genius who had a wonderful way of approaching magic, and this is Ghost Card, which was released with Tenyo, and what's cool about this is that it is a very, very deceptive effect. You see this thing, and it's got this little holder you place the cards into, and then the cards appear to go inside of your mouth, and you produce the rest of them behind your ear, or whatever you want to do. And um, I showed this. To you. I showed you the effect, you know. And then you know you kind of have a theory, but then you see how it actually works. You're like, that's really clever, which is kind of the way that a Tenyo trick works. So that is my uh, my favorite thing I've been playing around with is just this this ghost card effect. What do you have? What do you got? I've got a recommendation. This is a this is a vintage recommendation. Okay. So if you can find one, especially if you can find one get one of these um and th this is sort of a good time to mention this because uh here it is it is the magic show oh yeah uh, from mark said ducati and this is an unbelievable book i've actually got two copies There's i've got copy. two copies of it too <laughs> uh and andrew you love pop-up books right you've yeah. got like a, a whole collection I got of, a huge them, so of them yeah yeah you you know probably more about this book than i do but um mark at, speaking of the earlier question, Mark is actually one of the most uh, influential people on, on the Magic as well. Because growing up, I had all of the uh, most of the Magic Works sets, mm -hmm. um, which were similar to the Tenyo ones, but sort of rethemed. And he had some really clever uh, electronic versions of them as well. And I didn't know who Mark was until I found out who Mark was, and he's pretty amazing. Um, and more, they, we could do a whole episode just on. Yeah incredible mark is but this book starting with just the the beginning of it here uh it's got this little where is it got this trick on it i don't know if it's gonna well if you can get a copy of this it's or, it's, it's or, amazing because the book will fool you it's done it's a pop-up book that you play the first time through you do it and it fools you as just the person reading it it's ingenious the way it's designed, and then you can actually perform it for other people and do the magic in there as just sort of if you're presenting it to it. Uh, it is, yeah, I've got a couple copies of it. I highly, highly re recommend if you can find it. I had to get two copies to get all the pieces. It's a, it's a great pick. It's a, it's a wonderful book. It's a fun sort of thing to show people. I, uh, every time I have magicians come hang out at my house, if they haven't seen that, I sit down and I have them just read it and go through the whole thing and they get fooled really, really badly. Mm -hmm. And these are professional magicians who know a lot and are really clever guys. And this book destroys them. It's and it did, it did for me the first time I ever read it. I, there's a couple things in there I was very surprised about. I've got a couple other magic pop-up books I'll show sometime too. That's hmm. uh, one, one of the things I can like. Thanks. So, uh, Jordan, we're about to wrap things up here, and what's going to happen next is we're going to go record the secret session, and Jordan's going to show me the work on his effect, uh, the Siri finale, which is a cool 
uh, effect you use using your iPhone and using Siri and Siri makes a revelation. And then we're going to also talk a little about some other things you can do with iPhones and iPhone magic. So, uh, if you're into that, then check out our Patreon page because that's how you can get into the secret session. So, sir, I think it's time we adjourn this meeting of Magic Club. Sounds Imaginary good. gavel. Closed. Thank you all for joining us and uh, check out our next episode. This it, We're probably going to record a couple of these at a time. So if you're watching episode one, episode two is probably up too. So you can jump right in if you choose. And please subscribe, follow us, support it. Become part of Magic Club. Don't just make us the I, only members. I don't know where the, the icon's going to go. It might be so right here over our faces. I don't know. It's anywhere. Yeah. Could be all these places. And you can check us out too at magicclub.tv. Go to magicclub.tv. We've got our channel embedded there, and you can find all the links for what you need to do to subscribe for our email list, follow our channel, which you're watching us on YouTube, you already know how to do, and find our Patreon. So go to magicclub.tv and it's there. So, uh, Jordan, good day. Good day to you, sir.